I don't use that as like, don't trust the Bible. It's more complicated than that. I like to think Andy is actually leading Satan in body exercises. See, he needs to work out too. You know? Five, six, seven, eight. Seven, eight. The challenge a lot of people have is it feels like the Old Testament God was di is different than the New Testament God. And how do I reconcile those two things? She's defining what deconstruction is, and then they're kind of calling out people who are deconstructing as it's a negative. Look at Satan. He's so sweaty. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Bros, Bibles, and Beer. It's episode 229. This is Jeff. I'm joined by my brethren, Zach and Andy. Andy, how's it going? I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Zach? Uh, being Christ-like is biblical, not everything biblical is Christ-like. And it's Super Tuesday, and I am super. Oh, you nailed it. I'm, I'm more super because I'm getting my lost credit card back somewhere up in faraway lands. Did you cancel it? I did not. I, I held off for an extra day for some reason, thinking I would find it in my clothes. I didn't. And then I got a phone call this afternoon. Hey, we've got your credit card. Mr. Pearson? <laughs> and I don't know. They said your information was on it. I'm like, are Costco cards, do they have all your information on it? At least the phone number? Mm, that's a pop. I'm yeah. like, if, if, if that's the case, I'm so happy that Costco City Cards put our phone numbers on it. All your personally identifiable information. Social your security. Children's birthdays. <laughs> addresses. Thank you, Costco. Apparently, CIA. Last if, 10 years of your workload. Apparently, the Costco visa, if you leave it in the snow, it, it like pings the host city. And so they're able to find it and contact you too. So good job, Costco. Well done. Great. Anyway, that's why it's super. And it's also Political Super Tuesday, which does anybody care? Uh, well, it's not means, Fantastic Tuesday. What does that mean again? That some primaries are the voting? California primary. Well, actually, most of them. There's, What's that? <laughs> there's most a, states. There's a bunch of states. Not there, that I looked on the map. It might have been like 10 or 12 states. Okay. Well, should anyway. we start out with what we're drinking, boys? Sure. Definitely not who we're voting for. <laughs> the number one libertarian candidate. George Johnson, Sorbonne style. Oh, man, Mrs. or Mr. Sorbonne style really has captured my imagination politically. <laughs> where, where are you going? I don't know. What is I'm just Sorbonne yes, style? andy okay. Okay. Yes. All right. Uh, I got us uh, some Pilsners tonight. Boys from Smog City, the little Bo Pills. Let's see what we got here. Why you hold that up there? There. Yeah. One of these little guys, little Bo Pills. What do you think about that? Looks like a Pilsner. Yeah. And uh, watchers, listeners, this doesn't matter. Crisp. It doesn't matter to you as much. But but watchers, if uh, the camera angles seem a little interesting, well, we'll tell you a secret at the end of the show. But we're not going to tell you right now why it might be a little interesting. Oh, stay tuned to that. Yeah. Uh, and what else you got going on there, Zach? You're not only drinking, you're drinking for two. <laughs> I'm knocking on heaven's door. <laughs> Once again, I don't think I'll ever get in. At least that's what some say. But uh, I'm going to keep trying. And, and I am dry because I had another gincident, as my wife <laughs> says. <laughs> oh, I like that. Uh, gincident. <laughs> went to Mammoth, and when I got home, she said, so did anybody, uh, well, I'll just put it in a different way. Did anybody drink too much? Yes, I did. <laughs> and she's like, what did you drink? I'm like, what, everything what didn't i what didn't i drink <laughs> like i i had gin and whiskey and and uh and then i had a bad night and she said gosh you think one time you you would uh learn I'm like nope it's gonna take a couple times <laughs> so uh anyway I'm, I'm dry and uh it's when you mixed them and you called it your special jisky drink <laughs> That's when i was like uh, i don't well, know i was thinking of being just a good guy and i'll there were some guys, you know, I think you guys were at playing pool or ping pong or something like that. And I'm like, I'll bring a drink because they didn't come back. I'll take one for me, one for them. And and then I drank both of them. It was nobody wanted you. any of it. <laughs> and I, I double fisted within about 45 minutes. Oh, that, Plus, ex that explains. Now I understand. Plus jacuzzi where you sweat way oh, more than you think you do. Lost all my hydration, everything gone. Yeah. Yeah. That's that was it was fun though, and we did jump in the snow in board shorts. 
wow. That's true, and that's, that's right. refreshing. I, and I tried to get the snowblower guy to, to oh, yeah. shoot the snow. Tell, me, tell this story. It. So, listener, we're like, we're in the jacuzzi, and we're kind of daring each other to uh, get out of the jacuzzi and go and like lay face down in j- piles of snow. Man, boys are dumb sometimes. We're dumb, but it was awesome. You guys all did it. And then I went out there, and I saw the guy blowing all the snow. There was so much snow. I'm like, I just want to jump in front of that and just, he can shoot me with the snow blower. And he just gave me a very somber, n- n- no, that's yeah. not going to happen. And I think when I came back in, he's probably like, that guy's probably like, look at these frat boys. Jackasses. You know, look at these guys. Idiots. Yeah. yeah, that, that, he's all covered up. He looks like, he looks like a stormtrooper. Yeah. And that, that just somber. Mm-mm. And he already saw us, saw, he saw us two days before that. And we're like, our toilet is backed up. And he just showed up with his plunger in his trash bag and went downstairs and then told somebody, it's not backed up. You just need to hold the flush. Just flush longer. the toilet. Just make sure you flush the toilet. Okay. Okay. Thanks. I, I did. Seven times. You didn't hold it long enough. All right. This is your hot potty talk. Yeah. Hot <laughs> potty talk. So if you go to youtube.com slash bros, Bibles, beer, this is Jeff licking his wounds, repenting of his sins, yeah, well, and you'll see it. Well, I need to edit that out of my life. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listener, uh, welcome to the podcast. We don't usually do this, and I forgot to mention that maybe we should get in the habit of it. We talked about it. But this is a podcast, Bros, Bibles, and Beer, and it's three of us guys, and often we have a, a guest. We're good friends, and we like to talk about faith and culture and uh, beer amongst other things as well correct serious conversations while not taking ourselves too seriously that's what we're going with right now but i don't know if it's less serious when you have gin and whiskey yeah a strong jisky will do that to you yes yeah i we have gotten feedback like i i hope they're actual friends because it otherwise they're they're doing a good (laughs) job like yes we've been friends for so many years and we've been doing this podcast for shorter than that but and youtube even shorter than that but actual really good friends and maybe you see things a little bit differently on some things and we still are friends. Yay. I don't like you. Speaking of seeing things I, differently. I don't like your opinions. Um, did you want to share something, show something? You had a few things queued up. What do you want to do here? Jeff, you want to do the video? Or you want to do the questions? Let's go video first. Okay. Jeff says video. So deconstruction seems really cool. I feel like a lot of the cool musicians are, are no longer Christians. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Hello, I would like to join the conversation. <laughs> deconstruction is sweeping the land. And so there's a lot of apologetics type people, YouTube channels um, that are uh, aggressively trying to explain it and help defend, help parents defend against their kids uh, deconstructing and whatnot. Um, as somebody who deconstructed before it was cool i like to say um and feel like i'm in a perpetual state of testing things which is i'm i love now i didn't love so much when it was first happening um yeah i i got some thoughts on it and let's see if uh we've got a list of childers on deck who has got a fairly large youtube channel relating to apologetics and um of a lot of things but deconstruction she's got a new book out about deconstruction and so I stumbled upon this. It's her and Frank Turek. If you haven't heard of him, he's a pretty well-known Christian apologist defending the faith, which is what apologetics uh, aim is to do, is to defend the faith. Do you not like that? Do you not like defending the faith? Um, it depends on what you mean by defend and faith. <laughs> uh, no, I like apologetics was, was helpful for me. I was, I was very into it. What do you mean by the? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you asked, Andy. Uh, let's see. Sorry. So, Reasons to Believe yeah. is a, another big one. I was really into them. William Lane Craig, people that that help equip the saints, as it were. And I'm I'm not knocking that. It sounds I, like you are. Oh. It does. Um, be- <laughs> and maybe I am. <laughs> Confession time. No, I, I think there's, there's a mode to it, but I think they they get some things wrong um 
I don't disagree with the idea of having reasons for believing what you believe. So their her- their hermeneutics to you is wrong, which is why you not necessarily. I, I think sometimes are pe- they inputting things in? People look at apologetics to no. We can we can prove God. We can prove the resurrection. That sort of thing. The best apologists will not use the word prove. They won't say they can prove anything, uh, which I appreciate because you can't. Sean McDowell, um, the son of Josh, Josh. McDowell, uh, Biola University. Um, he's somebody I, I like listening to. He's way more conservative uh, biblically and faith-wise than I am. But uh, And I wouldn't necessarily classify myself as a progressive, but depending on who's listening, you'd probably put me there. So we'll, we'll leave that What are we there. talking about now? I know. What are we talking about? So many words. I know. Oh, so words. I, I, I brought some salad dressing for I, you. I just never knew if you, when you talked about deconstruction, if it was, uh, there's this in the Bible and people over the years have always believed this. And I looked at it and I see something different and I think they're wrong. And how could they? Uh, and then that seemed to be deconstruction, listening to other people who talked about it. Yeah. You're not asking the tough questions. Well, if I... Let's do it. Ever get to this video? They, <laughs> I'm gonna, we'll, we'll go off of their. Okay. They define it, and we'll go off of that. And so. he's falling asleep. Let me ask: How many of you have heard the word deconstruction in the context of faith? Okay, so maybe, maybe half. So yeah, I'll give you a picture of what it looks like. I'm sure you've seen it, even if you don't know the word. It might be a Christian author, famous pastor, seminary professor, maybe a, a, an author or singer. A lot famous. of musicians have done this where they'll go on Instagram and say, you know, I, I've really been wrestling with my faith. I've had all these hard questions. Nobody could answer my questions. And so I'm out. I'm no longer a Christian. Probably the most famous one would be Josh Harris. Remember, I Kissed Dating Goodbye, that iconic yes. book from the 90s. Mm. Yeah. And so this has rattled a lot of people because they're using the word deconstruction to describe that. And so what we see in the deconstruction movement is that ultimately at the core, it's a shift of authority. So it's not just having some doubts. It's not just searching after truth, but you've become unsure if the Bible is true, but you want to know what it is. You're searching for what the truth is. That's not what we're talking about. It's not, you know, we want people to engage hard questions and to ask the hard things. But in deconstruction, you're not doing that quest based on searching for truth or even having the Bible as any kind of a standard of authority. You've shifted the authority to your own self. And this is, they'll say this outright, that if you're oh, going to you, a Jeff. book or you're going to any external authority, you know, you're vulnerable to cult-like mentality and b- to be oppressed and harmed by these toxic doctrines. No, you so are deconstruction, Alyssa. you go with what works for Welcome you. You go with cult. what you deem by your own moral compass, which by the way is broken Hold if Christianity so wouldn't apologists and theologians and biblical scholars be considered third parties? Correct. She's a little loose with her language there. Well, and she's what's being assumed is that the Bible is the authority. And what's being assumed is like the Bible. I think she would nuance it differently if I, if we were, having a dialogue, yeah. but I think generally the assumption is no d- people deconstruct because they rely on their own authority and their own feelings versus relying on the authority of the Bible, which assumes that the Bible as a whole is authoritative. And that's where like, she's me being uh, somebody that's deconstructed in the sense that she's talking about almost like losing my faith and throwing everything out. Not there anymore. Although, you know, fingers crossed, I'm still, still got (laughs) time. The book on me is not finished. Um, non authoritative book, but it, it wasn't, it had zero to do with like, I just don't like that. I'm throwing it out. It had more to do with, I've been told this thing about the Bible that it's you. If you don't interpret Genesis one correctly you cannot get the gospel right it's like if you can't if the bible isn't this then it's nothing and you know carrie love you bro long time listener carrie robinson what, what he kept saying when we were talking about like but biblical inerrancy like how do you know about jesus through the bible and he's the assumption there is that like because we know about jesus from the bible therefore the bible is true and i'm, I'm thinking 
we can know things are true about people. It doesn't mean the entire Bible, which is a, a you know, a mix of countless editors, several authors over well, this a couple always, thousand years. This has always come back to you going, well, humans wrote this as a, and you're like, so there's got to be errors. And how come these yeah. questions haven't been asked? And everybody just wholeheartedly believes this. And I, I have some questions about that. And so now I'm deconstructing. But that's old. Like that's been around forever. Pe- people have, have always wondered about these sorts of things. And, right. <clears throat> and just because it is written by humans um, doesn't discredit it necessarily. True. And so what I would like to argue against is the idea that you have to, the Bible is all correct all the time. Inerrant, guess, what do you mean by correct? Inerrant and infallible. So inerrant is always... Pretend like I don't know exactly what those words mean. I'll say this for Chad. Yeah, Chad, this one's for you. In- inerrancy in all its... like We could actually look up the Chicago statement on inerrancy, which was like the authoritative, like, we believe this that most churches ascribe to, but it's a version of inerrant and in- in inf- infallible in all that it teaches or professes. And so there's it leaves wiggle room. Inerrant... It's so, without error in the original documents. And guess what? Nobody has the original documents. And and that's like, I don't use that as like, don't trust the Bible. It's just, it's more complicated than that. And would I, anybody else like present a different definition than what you just did? Do you uh, think? Um, yeah. Well, they would use more words and probably do it more articulately. <laughs> but I just mean like, would they? In, in general, in, inerrant and inerrant in all that it teaches. So what, yeah. what it, when it's te- instructing us, it is without error. But, and they also will say in the original documents because nobody has those. So, which gives the wiggle room of, um, if you do find an error, it's possible that, well, we just don't have the original document. And you can trust that the original documents don't have error because we've declared it essentially. What's an example of an error that bothers you? Um, I, I wouldn't say it's an error. I would just say a difference. Um, one being, um, so what is, what is God like? Um, well, I, I did write down the, in Matthew five and the other gospels too, but, during the Sermon on the Mount, um, there's the, you have heard that it is said yeah. passages. And you have heard that it is said, but I say to you, Jesus is saying, what do you guys think that means? What do you think Jesus is doing there? Uh, he's, well, he's setting up the idea that the gospel is superior to Old Testament law. And I don't hate, oh, God. I've never podcasted before. I, I, I don't hate that, um, but I I think some people would disagree with you there. Um, I just read I'm not. I just not. read it in my NIV Study Bible today. In Did you Hebrew, really? In Hebrews, it literally yeah. was just saying like that. Yeah. It describes that Jesus is setting up this concept that that um, that the gospel is that there is a hierarchy that it is above, which is what he kind of describes. Hey, it said this. Here's the law, right? And Old Testament law is probably where I should be more accurate. The law said this, but I say this. So that's Jesus teaching as right. part of the gospel supersedes. Jeff, what is, you have heard it said, but I say to you, do, does it sound like um, leading the witness already? What do you, sure. <laughs> what, what do you think about that? I, it's not go, a trap. I'm going to go ditto with Andy. <laughs> well, it, it implies like something is changing. I and, will have sure. too, I will have too much word salad. So continue. And, Jeff's and, on my team. And I want to stress and I'm going to try not to caveat going forward about this. This is not me saying the Bible isn't true or you should ditch the Bible um, or me trying to destroy faith. It's just that I was given also one more caveat because I found out that my mom listens to our blog. <laughs> um, and this sounds thank like you, parental, mom. Hi, mom. parental rebellion. You got to uh, of age. No, but my dad grew up in Seventh Day Adventism, which most people would define as a cult. And my mom was Church of Christ, like some people hardcore would. Church of Christ. And so they moved the ball forward so much, and 
and it wasn't this isn't on them at all it's my upbringing plus like i got really into apologetics and prove being able to prove my faith okay that sort of thing and learn you know feeling like the idea was you know ken ham says if you can't get genesis 1 right you can't get the gospel right and so i think a lot of christians have a version of that where if you were to say be able to prove and i don't think you can do this but if you were to be able to prove that genesis 1 1 you know didn't happen or it's not historical i i don't think it's historical in the way most people think most christians think but if you could prove that then therefore you can't believe in jesus correctly like that is the logic that is set up and i had a lot of that and so when i started to discover some of these like wait a second like like some of these differences or yeah you know, i get that yeah. Th- that presents a pretty tough um situation because there are there are multiple interpretations of of genesis one the the most common like just don't tell can the, yeah, the most common piece is like is it is it actually seven days or i mean because in other parts of the old testament it describes like the concept of time for god that you know a, a thousand years is as a day so um but my my question is like, it doesn't need to be. So Ken Ham represents one group of ways to interpret and think about correct the Bible, and then there are lots of others. Like I I never grew up with any of that. I didn't ever grow up with someone who said, "Hey, if if you if you think that the that Genesis is a story, uh, ma- man's attempt to describe how um, creation came about." versus it is like a documented recollection if if you disagree on those things and you're not a christian like i didn't i didn't grow up with that right Th- there was some wiggle room there mm-hmm. and and i i i know that there are ken ham has made a career on this and i'm not knocking him for it i'm just saying like this is this is what he's chosen to like sort of establish and found his ministry and his thinking like he has, and there's there's some interesting stuff in there. That's, that's his niche in the gospel yeah. world. Yeah, and so he that's he has this belief. He's sticking to it. When you do that, you have lots of people that will follow you sure. and believe the same. Right. If you're the, just kind of across the board, it's like, but anybody can belong. Then everybody's not really. And committed. I'm not bothered by either interpretation. Like it just doesn't. It doesn't bug me because I don't think I don't make that connection to my salvation. My belief is that G, like the it, power of Jesus. That's, I mean, a miracle worker, incredible power in believing and right. having faith. But you're not, I don't think you're as at risk for deconstructing your faith as it is now because you weren't given the baggage of like everything or nothing. Mm. And so all it takes is you pull one, one card out of the house of cards as opposed to like, what if it was constructed in a different way where you could like it is a more of a jenga and this is a shitty analogy but where you can no you could pull this and the whole thing's not going to tumble down and see where that piece might go that might work better um and so it's not about ken ham necessarily it's just a a version of a, a version of that where it's like all or nothing you know being being told like well i don't think this part of the bio i don't think this is actually what god is like for example, so we we mentioned the um, you have heard it said. So that section, Matthew five forty three, you have heard it that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Look at this, guys. We're reading the Bible on this podcast. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. By the way, you can find parts in the Old Testament that talk about if you're unrighteous, you don't get the rain to grow the crops. And if you're righteous, you do. So this this is an elevation of that. I'm looking at you, Arizona. <laughs> if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? And pagans in, the, in this case is anybody that's not Jewish. Um, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. So that was one of those passages that was like a light bulb moment. Like, oh, this is saying, how is your heavenly father perfect? 
he's perfect in how he he's generous whether you're righteous or unrighteous doles out love whether you're good or bad kind of a thing now you contrast that with something like psalm 137 where david is just lamenting the destruction of jerusalem and now in this passage david doesn't say like god is cool with this but i i feel like i I don't have a problem with this what i'm about to read because it's it's more like i'm really pissed and i wish things i wish bad things would happen to my enemies it's something that all of us will feel at some point so psalm 137 8 and 9 is oh daughter babylon you devastator happy shall they be who pay you back what you have done to us happy shall they be who take your little ones and dash them against the rocks now it it's not prescriptive and it's not saying god is cool with that but it's it's biblical as it were in, in the sense that is is this a very like is god cool with that behavior you can find the commands for genocide in the old testament um does that line up with the god from the sermon on the mount God is perfect. Be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect and ha- that he loves his enemies. Well, fortunately, we, I mean, there are different types of writing in the Bible. There are songs, there are stories, there are allegories. Um, there are some that are attempting to be more historical in their context. But I don't think it's, we shouldn't be reading the Bible as to say every single thing in the Bible is a direct instruction of what you should do. Correct. Like, David sleeps with Bathsheba and goes and sends her husband to die in the front lines. That's not a direction for us. It's biblical though. It's in the Bible. But it obviously like later on, it's like basically David, how dare you? Like Samuel totally convicts him and slaps his hand. Right. So, so what you see in the Bible is humanity. And I think, and so while he's emotional and calling out for justice and and retribution for the evils done against his people um and it and and it's also a given time like what lots of biblical biblical scholars will talk about a way of uh, the challenge a lot of people have is it feels like the old testament god was is different than the new testament god and how do i reconcile those two things and the common way that most biblical scholars or theologians think about it is god is is to his people what they need at that time right i think there were i think it was irenaeus gosh if i'm wrong i will humbly change irenaeus uh uh that heresy was like oh these are different gods like god old testament is different god of the new testament is different they're not the same and so I, I get why somebody would get to that point. Um, but but I, I don't I don't agree with that, but it's I just think it's I think there's this project uh, progression of people's understanding of God. And so when Jesus comes along and is like, you have heard it said, but I say unto you, the math that I was doing, so my deconstruction isn't like I don't like this anymore, throw it out, although it's part of it, but it was like, no, I feel like I feel like I was misled, not intentionally. Yeah. It was, I don't think it's malicious. I just think it's, this is the way the Bible is. And, you know, I'm young and I'm ignorant and I think like, oh, that's the way it is. And I don't know why anybody would see it different. And it turns out people see it differently for a lot of different reasons. Even Mm -hmm. Bible believing Christians see it way differently. And so it, that's what led to deconstruction that plus personal experience and tragedy um it's not an all or nothing thing so i don't know maybe we we press play again and and see where it goes um let's come back to yeah christianity is true but you follow that to cobble together what you think god is and your path for you and that's really what deconstruction is that was so well defined and put thank you for that notice how you elisa just pointed out some of the things that Frank they Turek. say that somehow Christianity is toxic or it's abusive. Notice those are moral terms, that they have this moral standard by which they seem to say that what you believe as an evangelical Christian is wrong. Again, by what standard are they saying this? And it is true, however, we have to admit that Christians have not lived up to the Christian ethic, that we have all fallen from that. And uh, Dr. John Dixon from 
now he's at Wheaton, I believe, asks anyone who ever feels, well, let me just ask the question, how many people in here have, know of others who have stayed away from the faith, stayed away from God because Christians have been mean to them? Or they've been hypocrites, right? Yeah, most of us, right? Dixon mm. asks you to ask those people this question. When somebody plays Beethoven poorly, who do you blame? You don't blame Beethoven. You blame the player, right? So when somebody plays Jesus poorly, you don't blame Jesus. Look, just because I'm not... And I, I actually agree with that a lot. Or I just agree with that. I don't know why I have to say a lot. But there are people that because they run into a shitty Christian and all of us are at in varying levels that therefore like, Oh God isn't real. There is a version of deconstruction that's that. And I agree with like, don't throw baby Jesus out with the bathwater because some, some person that was holding a Bible was a jerk. That's not, and that's not special to Christianity. Like it's not no. exclusive. It's whatever the thing is. I went to go play softball in a league and everybody there were dicks and assholes. And so I decided to not go do that anymore because I didn't like the people. Like no more softball. Softball it gets connected with the dicks, and so I'm not gonna go back and play. Not gonna go back and play. Yeah, but you know what? I would ask the question: Should you should you separate it though? I mean, yes, we can always encounter someone who's who's terrible and 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 is a poor representation because we're all humans and we mess up and we there, there's no perfect representation of Christ in humans but that's different than like a pastor that is actively like abusive emotionally spiritually sure maybe physically sexually and all while like well I have the authority and so therefore you should do this and there, that that exists too there yeah mark driscoll's great example embodiment of of that authoritarianism abusive relationship that was intending to directly represent who jesus and christianity for tens of thousands of people and and not even behind the scenes it wasn't it was dark it was yeah. really dark. I'm smiling, not because it's funny, but just because it's so wild. And I'm I'm going to butcher his quote, but he he did say a version of he is able to, with crystal clear clarity, the spirit has given him the ability to visualize the sexual sins of the leadership of the church. And so he, God allowed him to see their sexual sin, the type of person that would do that. Oh, my God. That's like a personality disorder and a half. Um, but yeah, it's what you just said. Daryl, you've been unnatural with your wife. I saw it in my mind's eye. It was brought to me in a dream. You and your wife. What is uh, unnatural? What is the reverend's name in Letterkenny? Because <laughs> that's what we're, I know, we're that's doing a I'm, version of that. That's, uh, that's, that's who I've defaulted to. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Wayne? <laughs> hey, Wayne. <laughs> What are we doing? It, it feels it feels like uh, Alyssa. <laughs> I'm gonna cut back to this. Alyssa, is, thank you. <laughs> thanks for being the adult in the room. <laughs> she is. She's defining what deconstruction is, in, from you know her own perspective, and then and then they're kind of calling out people who are deconstructing as um, it's a negative. Like yeah. you're you're creating your own you're creating your own um, god and or you're playing god yeah. and you're just throwing everything out or or you just weren't a believer in the first place and I guess my question to you Zach is do you feel or do you think let's and, ask it to everybody yeah, yeah. Zach uh, he just we're not I'm, going to interview uh, Zach again no we're not and no, we're Andy not. and and Jeff and everyone. Uh, do you feel like deconstructing is really just a, hey, I was told all of this and I believed it with all of my heart and soul for my entire life. And then I got to a point where I'm like, wait, if I ask this question, it, it kind of changes things. Or when I bounce that verse and this verse uh, against True each other, beautiful. It's, Does it's it mean something Jesus? totally different. And And so I guess the question is, was it more the search for, there's more to this than what I grew up with? To put it in simple terms. Yes. Yes. And you you can go through life 
Like if you're if you're given this very like I use rigid, not in a negative way. Like this, this is the way the world works. This is the way the Bible works. And that's the way it is. And you stay there. That's possible. If, if you just consume that and you stay in that echo chamber, um, again, not negative echo, we're all in echo chambers of varying capacities. Uh, but if you get outside that a little bit and somebody comes up to you that also is like, I love Jesus. Um, I believe he rose from the dead. I believe he's the son of God, all that stuff. And they they also know some of the scholarship. And that's the thing. I think a lot of Christians don't get scholarship. So a lot of pastors will know things about the Bible that they can't really say because it it would add a layer of complexity that wouldn't necessarily undermine the faith, but it would add complexity in the way that's like, oh, I, I haven't heard that before. What else have I not heard? And that's what triggers the snowball of like, if you're really curious and you you just want to know how things work uh, w- with your faith and what you care about the Bible enough to be like, oh, there's this way to read that passage. You know, what else is under that hood that can like trigger that snowball of deconstruction? It's not always the, no. oh, I just, I hate the authority of the Bible and therefore I will rely on my own experiential authority. And I think sometimes anti-deconstructionists in the Christian sense can go there like, oh, you just, you don't, you want your own authority. You don't want the authority of the Bible. It's more complex than that. And I think she alluded to it. Maybe, maybe we're just getting caught up in semantics with what she's describing. We wouldn't be bros, Bibles and beer without that. But, but because she said, Hey, I'm not talking about asking hard questions, but maybe, maybe that is the part. Maybe, maybe she should be talking about people who are sitting here asking hard questions. And I think what most people who encounter this crisis of faith is there's something in my life that I, that I can't make sense of that. The Bible doesn't make sense of that. My faith doesn't make sense of, and I can't reconcile these things together. And so what do I do with this now? What, how do I, how do I, I, I've got to make a decision one way or another. Either I start to pull the threads and that can be scary or Maybe I'm in a position where I'm hurt and, and, and I'm angry. And so I'm looking for reasons. I like forget pulling the threads. I've got the scissors out and I'm cutting the sweater. I don't, I just don't understand. I like that. I, I, I just don't understand why people like these folks. They're Christians. And if there are people going through that scenario that you're throwing out there, Andy, which many, many people do, most people do, um, they have doubts and questions and they're like, I feel a little lost here. I mean, that is, that is life that, you know, we're living, but it's like your fellow Christians, why are you, why are you putting people on the, the chopping block? Uh, uh, and who, well, maybe they're not fellow Christians anymore though. Well, that's why I'm like, what, what are you, what are you doing? What's the purpose of this? So I, let me make an argument in their favor. She mentioned like public figures leaders in Christianity, authors, musicians, pastors, people that lots of people looked up to. And a charitable interpretation of this might be, it's one thing to say, I'm struggling and I have doubts. It's another thing to be like, and I'm going to take everybody else down with me, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and maybe I'm putting words in her mouth, but like, I would think this is a charitable explanation of what she's kind of alluding to, um, which is just like we do with our own kids. Right. If there's something that's stressing us out, oh my gosh, whether it be financial or political or whatever, some some stability issue, there's a, there's a lot of it. They're like, okay, I'm struggling with this, but I don't need to make this problem my kid's problem. Right. Right. And I, I love that. And it's a good reminder to just reset. Like I, I, I want to be authentic to who I am at the moment. I almost hate the thing I just said, but it's true. Like I, I don't, my purpose is not to tear it on the faith. And I was kind of taught like, or some of the things I picked up on, and I'm not saying my parents, you're a good mom. Um, but it, from apologetics, it's often like, um, no, oh, shoot. I just, I lost my train of thought. That's right. I was, I was back. Our, uh, bro of the podcast, Art Greco often would describe it as, Hey, here's something that I'm really convinced of lately. I think he kind of would yeah, yeah. phrase it that way. Right. He would say, Mm. Uh, uh, there's lots of stuff I'm just not sure about this thing right now. I'm really convinced of this thing. Uh, yeah. 
and I, I, you brought him up. I I thought about him earlier when Jeff was talking. Like when we've been hanging out with him in person, he's just well, as we do. <laughs> you know how you hang out in person. Um, he he'll say I'm a ghost. He'll <laughs> <laughs> he'll say things like. Like when I talk about my deconstruction, he would like jump in and interrupt me like reconstruction. Like he's just like, he's like, he's like, there is no deconstruction. You're just, you're always constructing and remodeling. And I think that's a good way to look at it. Like everyone has a faith. Atheists have a faith. Agnostics have a faith because most of the stuff, when you keep asking the questions in, in spite of what these two might say, Frank Turek and uh, Alyssa Childers, like ultimately there is, it's just faith. Nothing is author- we, authoritative in the sense that you can know for sure. We can have strong feelings about things, but if you feel a hundred percent certain about anything, you're deceiving yourself. Um, and it's no except lo- for gravity. I'm pretty sure gravity always wins, but that's no longer faith, right? Like I don't need, I don't need faith in gravity. It's, it's evident. Right. Right. But a lot of times so that, the fundamentalist Christian turned atheist because of deconstruction or whatever, oftentimes become a fundamentalist atheist. And then they start making declarations as if they're ironclad about God not existing and your faith is rubber, whatever it is. I'm, I'm creating a cartoon character, but versions of that person surely exist. And they are, in spite of their assurance of what they're saying, it's ultimately a faith statement because they they can't know it. It's just they feel really strongly. But we're ho- we're always holding on to something. So whatever we're going through, we're, we're as you talked about art. Like there's there's something that we can grab onto and be like, this. I'm I'm not gonna let go of this because yeah. right now I'm having a tough time. I need some. We we have to have some cer- some certainty. Uh, some degree yes. of some degree of certainty. Maybe that's the yeah, better yeah. way to put it. Yeah, certainly. <laughs> but we need we need to hold on. And then at the same time there are going to be those things that we're not so certain of. And, and a, again, a charitable description of this would be, yes, hold on to those things that you can that are important and, and keep, keep testing the ones and, and don't feel like because you have other areas of uncertainty in your life, in your faith, that that somehow has just invalidated the, the, the pieces that you felt certain about. Like live with those two things in tension. Which is, not easy to do, especially as a young, we don't do that with our kids. Like we teach them, you have to teach a kid certainty. Right. And this is, I'm not talking about faith necessarily, although that might apply. Like when you first become a Christian, like, like certainty matters or, or, or the guardrails matter. Like what? So, but as you grow, as a kid grows, like the, the, I like the metaphor of like, there is no, a two-year-old, you're never running in the street. It's always a hard no. Because running the street is bad always. And you don't tell them the nuance of like, why? Or there might be times where you can run in the street because sometimes there's not traffic. You don't do that with a kid at all. But as they grow, you give them a little more leeway, a little more context. They learn the context of when can I go into the street to fetch my ball? There's a time and a place for that. And I think there's a version of that with faith. There is. Um we probably should add like a disclaimer to the front of the podcast that we are not biblical scholars, nor are we theologians. We are like armchair Christians at times. <laughs> who is who is the listener? I, I want to know if this was you where we just blew your mind where you're like, they're not scholars. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know who you are because I think that's apparent. But we, are, but we do like to have these conversations and we do, this is an attempt of ours to try to figure things out and we're not alone in that like yeah. christians all over the world are trying to figure these things out now there is a nugget of what she alluded to that i think is important for us to like pull on what you pull on nuggets i'm mixing metaphors here imagine that i'm, Im- pick, I'm imagining there's the nugget now pull on it do it pull it pull it pull the nugget <laughs> if you're not watching on youtube you're missing so much <laughs> There she describes some scenarios where a deconstructionist will have a lack of humility where they will, they will say, I, I'm going to basically, um, reject thousands of years of 
tradition, scholarship, um, deep uh, faith that's crossed dozens and hundreds of generations, uh, hundreds of generations. And so uh, I, I do agree with some of that where someone, you can look at that and just go, oh, you, you know better. Yeah. And, and, and not that that's a, that should be a pure excuse to just say just so just accept everything right however like a healthy part of that should be take that into account take into account someone like in the night in the 20th century a c.s lewis deeply thoughtful who can who is not afraid of going into the depths of theology in deeply meaningful ways brilliant guy like we shouldn't just toss someone like that aside or any number of biblical scholars throughout the hundreds of thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years. Oops. Sorry. Can't sorry. It's, it's only 6,000 or so. Mm. No, I, 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 I like that. And there is a version of deconstruction or the Christian deconstructionist that is, does a version of that. It, it, it's not wise. And I, I think I had phases of that where I was, I know it, better. Yeah, I know better, or you feel so much angst, you just want to ditch the whole thing. Because um, my mommy tells me so. Oddly enough, it was... Um, or I don't like what I hear. Some of that, too. Like, well, it doesn't... I don't I don't like that. It doesn't feel good. It's not how... Either it's not how I see the world, or it's not how I want to see the world. Right. Um, can I, I... I'll... Can I give you an anecdote of something that... Nope. Okay. <laughs> Okay, now you can. I second, I second that. Nope. <laughs> um, when I was feeling, um, I was feeling the most angsty. Like, I just want to. Th- I don't even know what's real anymore. Like, God help me. Blah 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 blah. I all just want to listen to Soundgarden all the time. All the time. Just Soundgarden. Uh, blow up the outside world. And there you go. Uh, th- that's the song. Um, but, Black hole. Sun. But it was. It was the story of Jesus and Peter, which I had never heard before. Um, Andy's head in the, Andy said it was right in there. Okay. What did he say? Nothing. It's, Camera cut to me. Yeah. Doing little edits. Sorry. We're not watching Pete, this anymore. It was so. Jesus and Peter. Yeah, we are. Oh, okay. Uh, um, Ooh, where Jesus, Jesus denies, or Peter denies Jesus three times. Yeah. And then later on, uh, Jesus comes to Peter and says, do you love me? And three t- it happens three times. Do you love me? Peter says, you know I do. Then feed my sheep. And like P- Jesus keeps asking him in a way that's like, what is Jesus doing? And this is a thing where like translations mm-hmm. and the English translation, it just doesn't do justice to the text, to what is actually going on. It, it's like when Jesus is asking Peter, do you love me? Jesus is using the uh, the agape version, and and Peter's like, you know, I do. Then feed my sheep. I'm, I might already be messing this up, but but the G- Peter couldn't match what Jesus was talking about. That's why Jesus kept asking him. Um, I, I feel like I should look this up. It was his goodwill hunting yeah. moment. Yeah, you know what I mean. You know, what I'm talking about the goodwill hunting moment. Go ahead. It was it was Peter's version of it's not your fault. Mm. Yeah, I, I'm, except in this time it was Peter's fault. <laughs> it was actually Peter's fault. It was. Jesus is like, do you agape me? Like in the full like self sacrificial version, and Peter wasn't there. But the last time Jesus asked, he switches to like, do you? I think the word is some version of like phileo, like where. It's, it's the friendship. Do you, are you here? Do you love me in this way? And Peter's like, you know, I do. And he's like, do then feed my sheep. So it's like, he asked three times. And the last time was, okay, I will come to where you're at. And it's translated. Do you love me every time? Mm-hmm. And you, you miss this context. And so forgive me for butchering this, but I was listening to, I think it was an NT right commentary or something like that while I was working out and about and i just almost started weeping because i was in the point where like i don't have mm. i don't have what i used to have mm. and it was just this sense of like it's okay if you don't have that yeah you're 
you're still here. I'm still here kind of a thing. And I don't know what to make of it. I can't, I can't explain it exactly how impactful it was, but it is an anchor point in like, do all the, the things you need to do, like keep searching, do all that stuff. And whether you have it or not, it's not the point. Like you're, you're, you still matter where you're at and just, yeah, that's Je- it. that's Je- it's Jesus saying, "Can you meet me here?" And Peter's like, "I can't." Yeah, and then he goes, "Okay, can you meet me here?" And Peter's still out. Not yet. I can't get there. Yeah. Okay. How about here? Yes, I can do that. Yeah. Okay. Then let's do that. Yeah. And and just like Jesus does with in so many times in the Bible, that's like that's the starting point. That's not the ending point. He's like, "Okay, we'll start here, but we don't want to stay here." Right. Yeah, I think the there's so much of society about accepting you, acceptance, like no matter, you know, healthy at any size, whatever it is, all all the gender stuff, like it doesn't matter what you are, you you know, ex- acceptance. And I think there's a good version of that where people have been ostracized for ver- any number of things. The danger is like the point isn't oh, you're maybe you're carrying too much weight that long-term is not healthy, healthy at any size, like stay there forever. It's important to recognize like you matter no matter where you're at, like you belong and and you're an image bearer. This, this is where I'm at right now. Like it, but don't stay there. Like that's what I'm trying to put on myself. Like just because you feel this way or you, you think this interpretation, that's, a, that's not, you're not finished. Don't stay there. And I think some of the danger of the acceptance movements is just, it doesn't matter. You can stay there. And we so have, we have growth and maturity in all other parts of our life. We should, hopefully, like yeah. that's, that's a healthy thing for us to experience. Why wouldn't that also be the case in our faith? And we should also experience spiritual and, and growth in our faith as well. Like, I would hope that we're not the same person that we were the first day we like the first moment that we truly encountered Jesus and made, made a decision at that point to believe in him and accept forgiveness, become a Christian. That's the launching point. That's not the, that's not the landing point. Um, yeah, that doesn't feel controversial. Everyone probably aligns with that, but, but maybe the, the controversial part comes in, Hey, accept me as I am. And, and don't ever expect that part to change. Like, right. yes, welcome you as you are and want the best for you. Jesus wants the best for you. He doesn't, he wants the best for all of us. Yeah. There's a version of us all being accepted where we are and called into being more than that. And there's a, yeah, there's a maturity of like going through life as a Christian of whether it's in friendships or marriage, whatever it might be. I mean, there's growth there. I mean, I, just looking back, it's probably, I was probably w- w- way more excited when I was first became a Christian. And then like, man, I'm looking through this lens. This is going to be tough. Yeah. It's, it's tough in, in, in marriage. It's tough in work. It's tough in how you converse with people and how you're seen. It's like, the honeymoon period, it exists like when you first have a relationship, that fire, that romance. Yeah. It's so good. You can't imagine a version of reality that doesn't involve you with that person and everything is going to be perfect. Everything is fire. But the work comes in at some point. Yes. I think that applies to your faith, that applies to like meeting a new friend, discovering a new podcast that gives you a new idea and you want to just tell everybody about it. You become an evangelist for some some idea like, oh, this is the way it is. You got to check out this podcast. So he, that, he has the answer or she has the answer. It it doesn't, you just have to keep sitting in that and then eventually it, you'll start to see little cracks in the armor and that that's where the work comes in or the discernment or with with marriage where you're committed to somebody. It's like, okay, I know who this person is. We've hit this rough patch. Let me look at the big picture and work through this kind of a thing because in it to win it, baby. I don't know. Those That's why I, on the last episode with Brandon, I, I challenged the statement, Jesus changes everything. Um, because that's when, when you don't 
at, when you don't unpack exactly what that means, especially with young Christians, oh, well, things are going to be better now, like automatically be better. And I feel like ev- almost every single person I've ever known growing up who became a Christian, like immediately faced like some huge gnarly thing in their life. And they're just going like, oh gosh, this is, this is really hard. This, this is extra hard. And it wasn't uncommon for them to go, wait, I became a Christian. I thought it was like, I thought I got to avoid these things. And that's not part of the deal. That's not, that's not included in part of the deal. So challenging Brandon to say, well, you were talking about the ultimate plan, the renewal of all things down the road. Yes. Eventually God's plan is to renew all things. That is the version of changing everything. But you need to say that and you need to be clear about that because when you say he changes everything, it, most people just go, well, great. Then tomorrow is going to be different. Cause you do have a version of, you have the prosperity preacher of the mega church that uses a version of that in a way that's like, health and wellness, wealth, all that stuff is coming your way if you just have the right faith. And whereas the template of like, okay, if you experience Jesus in the way like you, you are woken up to the radical idea that, oh my God, I'm, I'm forgiven, I belong, like that's awesome. If you experience true forgiveness and it's like a lightning bolt moment, um, that can affect the way you view the world and everything in it. So there's a version of that where it's like, yeah, Jesus changes the way you think ultimate self-sacrificial love. If you embody that, that will change every interaction you have uh, when you're at your best. And so so that's true. So some of your interactions. (laughs) Yeah, because nobody's at their best. Well, yeah. So it changes some of the things. Maybe we don't even need to go back to it. I feel like we kind of... Well, there's like a minute. Did seven laps around that one. We we might have. There's like a minute left. um, And I guess we're... Do you want to... If if it's really good. Talking with Tanya, we talked about this, about Jesus, Jesus changing everything. And that was... I think we came to the conclusion is, yeah, we have a different lens that when I became a Christian, I'd following Jesus, I'm looking through a different lens. I'm seeing people yeah. a different way. I'm, I feel guilt and shame much stronger. And when, when I'm, when I'm done wrong, it's, it just, it hurts so much before that. Eh, they'll get over it. I don't care. Whatever. Do you think that guilt and shame is from God? I believe that lens I'm looking through my faith in Jesus there it's it the burden is much greater um and the responsibility and the gravity of of every moment of our lives is much greater than before my belief in christ do you think god wants us to feel guilty or shameful doesn't doesn't want that I think that's why it's such, that's why we feel it more to p- try and p- push us away from wherever we've entered, whatever we've said, whatever action we've taken. If we don't look through that lens, then there's, it's just a free for all. It's chaos and it's meaningless. And there's supposed to be great meaning with our lives. I mean, we wouldn't have been created if it wasn't. We wouldn't, yeah. have been, we wouldn't have been given the Holy Spirit if if it wasn't supposed to mean something. Yeah, and maybe uh, is our conviction, guilt, and shame all the same word, same thing? Are those synonyms for each other? No, because I don't think so, because I feel like there is an unhealthy if you feel guilty because you've been told that God hates you when you're in your sin and God can't even look at you or you're not accepted, you will feel guilt and shame. And is that good? No, because I don't, I don't believe a God that according to the writer of Matthew, where Jesus says, you have heard it said, but I say to you, you know, sending rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Those are get rain is a gift in an agriculture society. And so 
feeling shame or like doing doing just something. Ask Noah. <laughs> just ask Noah. Yeah, it's biblical. It is biblical, but is it Christ-like? I see where you're going with the conviction and shame and being synonymous. There is something. There is something there. But maybe, I, I don't, maybe, maybe. Oh, sorry. Finish your thought. If, if as a dad, like, is it good if you like browbeat your kids into thinking like, as soon, whenever they make a mistake, you make sure they know it's wrong, and they make you make sure they feel it's bad. Is that how is is there a healthy way of doing that? Maybe, but oftentimes it's abusive, even if it's not physical. And so I, this isn't to say shame isn't important. I think there's a healthy version of like, oh shit, I made a mistake. And you feel that, that pang in your heart and you're like, how do I, how do I make this right? There's a good version of that. And so I think, I think there is a difference whether it's from God or not. I like, the, the word conviction, the Holy Spirit will convict you. I've heard so many people talk about being convicted about things that I'm like, dude, that's not the Holy Spirit. Um, so I, that's why I choose not to use some of that Christianese, but you know. Yeah. Conviction is a real thing and I, it can lead you to growth. Agreed. I think maybe to tie it back to what we were saying earlier about how Jesus accepts us where we're at and doesn't want us to stay there. Right, or he receives us, he welcomes us where we're at, but doesn't want us to stay there. And maybe there's something to that as well, where it's like he wants us to have recognition of those things, but he doesn't want doesn't want us to sit in it. Like, mm-hmm. like the pattern that he shows in the New Testament is like, okay, yeah, you messed up, stop doing that, like get up and go. Okay, yeah. go away, go on, and don't do that anymore. Like that's that's the method that he employs throughout the new testament and i think that's that's the pattern that he has for us it's not hey now you really fucked up go back i believe you (laughs) i think i did (laughs) go back and you need to sit there for seven days and think about what you've done deconstruction okay failure and then (laughs) only then once you've soaked in it then you can come back and start to move forward. Like, that's not what he does. Right. Now, there's a flippant version of it. Like, Jeff, I think what you also are describing is... But they were going to be like, you know, Jeff's flippant example. No, 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 no. There, there, there's a, there's a, a negative version of it, which is the opposite. Like, I, I send more for more grace. You know, like, you don't take anything seriously. Nothing has gravity in your life. And so, so it just, it doesn't matter. You're not you're not impacted by any of the stuff. Oh well, yeah. Sorry about that, God. I'll do better next time. Yeah. And that's not healthy either. I don't think no. Someone who's like that, they're just not. I don't think they're rooted too deeply in the soil, so to speak. Just like yeah, whatever. Yeah. And I think there is a tendency to like some of the Christian words, like or vernacular, like conviction or feeling convicted, or I just feel like. You know, sometimes when you deconstruct or your your faith morphs, it can be you just it it does turn into a season of a season. I just said it, a season of it, like Lowry, you know, just like a Lowry seasoning. Like oh. I'm I'm set free and set free in the way of like it it doesn't matter. Like your rigid rules are done, kind of a thing. And very quickly you will. Uh, I recognize the Lowry's comment. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sweet and salty. Very quickly, your life, the consequences, if you're honest with yourself, like you will realize, oh, it, it doesn't matter what I do. Like there are consequences. Gravity exists. You can't just, you know, key and peel it where you can do anything, kids. You can fly. Um, it's pepper spicy. There are consequences for actions. And I think there's a difference between consequences and punishment. And um, so... But I, well, you zigzagged at the end there. I didn't see that one coming. Yeah. Well, I didn't either. <laughs> That's the way I podcast. Uh, listener, in case you didn't know, we have no idea what's coming next at any point in time in uh, in any of our podcasts. Unscripted. Ever. It is unscripted. And so if you're like, wow, well, these guys don't really seem like they have it all together, then you should send us money so that we don't have to do our jobs. And then we could actually be able to put time and planning into yeah, this. Yeah, I could take classes on having it all together. I mean, I'm sure that class exists. Um, one final, th- or probably, hopefully, one final thought on deconstruction. I, I think the impulse 
for there's an impulse from the conservative end of Christianity, which we listened to part of, um, to like we need to fix deconstruction. And I think we just need to be be honest, like be honest about some of the difficulties in the Bible, because that's what most people that deconstruct, they realize like oh, the Bible doesn't actually say that, or when it says this, it doesn't actually mean that because the original language unlocked or unearths a little bit more context. Most most Christians are like just reading the English translation. It's like, well, it says it, there it is. So that answers your question. You shouldn't deconstruct anymore. It's like, that. that's not good enough. Uh, so I think a lot of it is just be honest about the things. And... We're not going to solve biblical inspiration. We're touching on it. For some biblical inspiration, for Alyssa Childers, it is more like God can't be wrong. He inspired the Bible. For me, I believe God inspired the the Bible, inspired the writers of the Bible, but I don't think God subverted human agency in that and human culture and where they were at. I think it's always through that lens, and that's the biggest difference from where I'm at versus I I had sort of a verbal plenary inspiration, which I think is said correctly, which is basically God dictated to the writers to write the Bible, what they wrote. That's kind of what I used to hold. I think most Christians don't really hold that, but it is enough of a strand of Christianity to where like, once you come out of that, it's easy to throw everything out because you're like, oh, God didn't write that part of it. I'm out. Yeah. I don't agree with anything you just said. Thank you. I think God, he wrote that whole thing through humans. Okay. Well, amen. Amen. And we're still friends. And we are. Right? Boop. And Andy's, and Andy's <laughs> deconstructing his life right now. He's I think like, Andy's what? deconstructing what I just said. <laughs> what did I just say? I already forgot. <laughs> Podcasting. No. Um, I think we talked a lot about this topic. A lot. We did. I think that but we did a good job. It's a hot topic. And I think... I like to think we just destroyed deconstruction. You know? Gone. Why doesn't anyone say renovation? That'd be I like that one. Why don't yeah. you go renovate your faith? Deconstruction is negative. It is. It's like renovate. And that's where it often gets used. I don't want to repeat, but you know, it's the demolition thing. Yeah. Just have the balls to say you're going to demolish your faith. <laughs> Or don't. Either demolish or renovate. Yeah. There's no in between. There's nothing you heard else. it here. There's yeah. nothing else. I'm putting up curtains on this verse of Luke. Curtains. <laughs> we should get some curtains in this church. <laughs> God bless Letter Kenny. You know That's what the new you know show. what the New Testament needs? An armoire. <laughs> armoire. <laughs> armoire. Maybe a sconce. <laughs> I'm a sconce with it. All right. Uh let's land this plane. Yeah. So should we talk about what we've been consuming? Well, Jeff talked about that a little bit earlier. <laughs> I recently consumed Letter Kenny with some of these guys when we were <laughs> losing our credit cards in the mountains. Yep. And that's where our inspiration for the preacher voice. <laughs> so don't be offended by that. We're just doing a version of a version somebody else did of a preacher. Yeah. It's not our fault. We just talk about the things that we like. Yeah. Are you, do you have anything that jumps to mind consumption wise? I'm re- I started reading Hebrews. But I'm reading it. I'm trying to do this in a different way than I've ever read the Bible consistently. So I have the like, remember the old school NIB study Bible that like you got when you were in high school or college. Um, it's basically you know the top half of the page is the scripture, and then the bottom half of the page is like explaining what's going on in every single verse. And so I'm like, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna do this exercise. I'm gonna sit here and just I'm not gonna try to cruise through every. Every single reference I'm going to read. I'm going to go look at this. Oh, it says this. All right, let me look down here. And I can make it through about a chapter a day. Hmm. And it's helpful. That's impressive too, because Hebrews... The Starbucks of Christianity. It's dense. Um, it, it is dense. And the whole like first couple chapters are really like, Jesus is better than angels, just so you know. Jesus is better than angels. There's angels, but then there's Jesus, and this is how it works. And that's how that's most of the first mm. couple of chapters of Hebrews. And in case you forgot, at the end of chapter two, to angels, Jesus. But there was a <laughs> there was a cool thing in it that 
it describes us as brothers of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I thought about that for the podcast tonight. I was like, oh yeah, that I was trying to remember if there's other places in the, in the new Testament that make that reference, you know, we're typically like thinking of Jesus as a father figure. I think a lot of times, but in multiple points, it's saying like, Hey, we are brothers with Jesus and that relationship mm-hmm. is, is different in many ways. And so I'm, I'm s- going to spend a little bit more time thinking about like, so what does that mean? How does that, how does that impact the way that I think about Jesus? The way that I would interact with Jesus, if I'm now thinking of him as if right. he were one of the brothers. Yep. Coincidentally, I listened to all of Hebrews in my car one 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 day Whoa. going to work and coming back um, a couple of weeks ago. And I recall that that stood out. Yeah, the brothers thing. Mm-hmm. It's cool. Yep. It's a good thing. I like that. What's up, Jesus is my brother. And coincidentally, Hebrews is a brewing company in the UK. Really? Yeah. Rose Babbles of Beer. That's such a coincidence. <laughs> you know, that first verse, the opening of Hebrews is so epic. And I don't want to read too much into it too late, but it it does have a little bit of a contrast. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Now, what is not the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word? In the previous, you. in the previous, yes, me oh. and and the prophets. It's this elevation, and I, I am humble enough because I'm a hero um, to recognize. Like, I don't make a mountain out of a molehill, but there is a little bit of like in the past you heard from God in a lot of different ways, but now, Jesus, yeah, and I think that I think that matters. It's, it continues to set that hierarchy. Like, this was these things happened in the Old Testament. And then they get superseded. Jesus is superseding these things. Yeah. And maybe that's why some people had had that, like, oh, the Old Testament God is different because it's way different than the New Testament God. And uh, I, I get that. But Or maybe there's a growth pattern. God is bringing us somewhere. God shows Abraham, no, you don't need to kill your firstborn son, even though I sort of told you to, and then stopped you at the last minute. But maybe that was God, like, elevating Sacrifice is not ideal. Come on. Come on, humanity. I'm going to not talk about the, the, the reading and interpretation of those actual, this is the opinion the actual of, definitions of those words that yeah. made that a lot more. It's a, it's a rat hole. I don't want to go down the rat hole. Yeah. Well, that's the opinion of Zach. It's not the opinion but of Rose Bible's mirror. No, no, I'll just say this. The language when he tells him to go up, is the language that's used when you look at the original text is indicating that you're coming back. Hmm. Both coming back. Yeah. So it's... Which is beautiful. Yeah. I think it's a, it's a beautiful lesson in like, yeah. You thought sacrifice was required, but guess what? Fuck that. That's exactly what it... I think that's what it means. <laughs> <laughs> we'll edit that out. Okay, uh, Letter Kenny, the Bible, like a real Christian, not yeah, a real Christian. Not a girl. Uh, Jeff, what are you consuming lately besides gin? Oh, the, uh, I am consuming detoxing. Uh, my wife and I have been watching True Detective, and all right, first season was great. The rest was, uh, gosh, horrible. Yeah, put you like those sleep. all those HBO sex scenes. Yeah, that's one thing that my wife has brought up. She's like, why does everything have to have this crap? And so when we were out anyway, of town. Anyway, next episode. Yeah, when we were out of town, she watched Goodwill Hunting. She's like, they just don't make movies like this anymore. There's no, there's not a ton of cussing, unless Matt Damon's character every once in a while. And uh, there's 
no like nudity really i don't think there's any nudity in it and it's just a, a well-written movie it's great and i'm like man you sat home and watched one of my favorite movies when i wasn't home i'm so bummed out but that's about it well my wife's consuming a whole lot better stuff than i am you were just hanging out with us. Like, yeah. How yeah. are we supposed to feel? I consumed gin, whiskey, and a porcelain god. And also friendship. <laughs> you ate our friendship. You ate our friendship for lunch and then threw it up. <laughs> and we watched you to make sure you weren't dying. Uh, that's good. I'm glad we're not um, stuck in a blizzard anymore, though. <sighs> that was good. All right. Let's land this plane. Hey. We're losing our energy, uh, and we know we've got to be better than this. So good. Uh, for Andy, my that's me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. oh, for Zach, hey, that's you. Hold on, YouTube, Bros Bottles Beer. Check us out. We are there. Subscribe, boop it, boop that subscribe, boop that like of all the videos. Just do that for me as a personal favor to your friendly neighborhood heretic. Also, Bros Bottles Beer on Instagram. The X, Facebook, and Bros Bibles Beer at gmail.com. Check out the shorts on YouTube. Uh, Zach spends way too much time doing those, and they're awesome. They're super fun. And uh, especially check out our most popular one, which is teaching you and Jeff how to speak in tongues. You ever wanted to learn how the to speak? The most in amazing thing ever. Yeah. And Jeff hasn't stopped talking about it. It's so simple. And it's so simple. People ask me now, what are you doing? Like, like it sounds like you're trying to buy a used car yeah <laughs> hey guys grace peace cheers Bloop. plank it plank blankety plank take yeah take the plank out of your own eye now take it out of your neighbor's eye take it out of your eye reverse grip Bent over rose. Anything you got to add, Jeff? Yeah, I feel like I'm at the zoo looking into the glass like, what are they doing in there? <laughs> hey, look, it's the monkeys. <laughs>